Hello, hello. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the first night of Life After Wellesley. I'm Jen Pollard. I'm the Director of Operations and Analytics for Career Education. And I also just wanted to thank the other partners on campus who have helped make this series possible. So we work together with the Wellesley College Alumni Association, um, Physical Education, Recreation, and Athletics, Residential Life, and Religious and Spiritual Life. So feel free to thank all of your staff that you know in those departments as well. Well. A couple of housekeeping items for anybody who's able to make all three sessions on the last night you will receive one of these beautiful embossed Wellesley notebooks. So that's our incentive to keep coming out and see these really wonderful events. Um, another thing to note, those of you who like to take notes like me during a session like this, please feel free to just hold off. You can if you want, but we'll make these recordings available for you to make your life a little easier tonight. So all of the recordings from the sessions will be available on our new website in about one to two weeks after the event. Um, just an extra plug, our new website goes live tomorrow, so go to the career education site and check that out. Um, and then for tonight, as a reminder, we're going to have Felice Dirks visit us. She's going to talk to you about managing your personal finances for the first hour. And then Katie Ryan, who is our program manager for internships in career education, is going to talk to you more about professionalism and some of those key skills that you'll need when you go off into the world after Wellesley. All right, without further ado, I'm going to welcome Felice up here. Thank you. Good evening, ladies. So first things first, I'm going to take a photo of all of you, if that's OK, because I'm some, oh, I saw a couple faces already look down. <laughs> Don't worry, I don't have any of your Instagram handles, so none of you can be officially tagged. But the reason I'm here, which some of you may or may not realize, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off by a question. For the first time ever in 2007, women bought cars more than men. First time ever. So I just gave you that little factoid. Think of overall spending on everything you can imagine. What percentage in the United States do you think women make up? Like what percentage of the total spending? What do you think? 70. Got a 70. What a 82. Any other guesses? 65. Ooh. <laughs> In the white is the closest. It's 61%. So we're responsible for 61% of all the purchases. But let's push on that statistic a little bit more. Of all the major purchases, like a mortgage or a bank loan or refinancing your house, what percentage of those decisions do you think women are involved with? I might have a ringer in the teal. She said 17, the number is 14. Do you understand why we're sitting here today? So we spend more, but yet on the important big ticket items, we let someone else make decisions for us. So hopefully we relaxed you a little bit with some food. I made a joke, one of the young ladies already laughed at me, it's not that funny. But full bellies, open mind. That's really the idea today. So both Katie and I are going to probably come at you with some things you may have thought of, may not have thought of. But really, the idea is just to think about it from a different angle. And afterwards, if you have questions, that's why my email is right up there. Write it down. Feel free. That's the idea. I'm also located in Wellesley, a whopping three miles down the road. So if there's anything we can do, we're here to help. In fact, a couple of your peers who are sophomores was actually at our office back in January. So you're going to probably see us more and more, hopefully, because we want to help you become basically the drivers in your own car, right? You don't want to Uber everywhere. You, sometimes you want to take control. So I'm really excited to be here today because I <coughs> obviously have a passion about women being in finance, being someone in finance. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to identify some financial planning basics. We're going to talk about some actions that you can take today while you're still in school. We're going to highlight what you should get ready for right when you graduate. We're going to also look and talk about maybe what you should be looking for when you're doing career searches. And also, we'll have some time for some Q&A. So it seems like a vanilla question, but what does money mean to you? And what you'll see is you know, what finances have impacted in your life so far. What I mean by that is, did it influence your college decision? Did your parents' finances take a big decision in where you went to school? Did you have to contemplate what aid you could have to offset with your parents? Does it also tie into your future and the goals you have for yourself? Okay. 
So quick question, does anybody in this room right now have an emergency fund? Oh, I have a couple. Nice, thank you, Taylor. So for the rest of the room, they may say, well, what is an emergency fund? Here's the thing I want you to all recognize. 50% of people in America right now, if they had an expense that was more than $400, would have to use credit. Take a minute to let that sink in. For anything more than $400, 50% of our population has to take some sort of a loan. See why an emergency fund could be important to you? So what is an emergency fund? We tell you, try to have that incidentals. Typically, we say three to six months of your expenses. That's how you know you have a cushion. And that applies if you're in college, when you graduate, when you have a family. The percentage is the same. The number just may be a little different, right? So rule of thumb, an emergency fund should be three to six months of, of your living expenses, not the shoe money, the going out money, right? The actual day to day. So it's important to think about building up your savings because really there's a lot of things that would happen. But more importantly, does anyone know how much money you should put in your savings out of every check you get? Oh, I hear some rumbles. 10.8, that was a very specific number. <laughs> Any other guesses? Oh, I heard the magic number, it is 20. So we're gonna talk about some rules of math and you'll hear me say 20, 20, 60, and I'll explain that. But every dollar that comes into your pocket isn't the same. And so when you think about everything you come from, you know, everything you've got, 60% of what you make is what you should live off of. If it's more than that, take a look in the mirror and say, what am I spending on? Are there things I can cut, right? So let's talk about starting early. If you just saved $100 a month, by the time you're, and you started at 25, anyone in the room 25 yet? Taylor, it's not 25 yet. Katie? Yeah. All right, we got a 25 year old. So if oh, Kate, older even better. <laughs> well, if, if, if Katie starting at 25 had put $100 a month every single month and just put it into a savings account, by the time you're 65, you have over $200,000 in that account. But here's the thing, if I just wait 10 years, 25 to 35, not that big of a deal you'd think, I have half the amount of money just because of those 10 years. But go one step out further to the woman who kind of looks like me, right, she's 45. If she starts saving $100 a month by the time she's 65, there's only $46,000. 100 bucks, that's all it was the difference, right? It's about starting that habit early. Let's look at that the same way but opposite. Let's say you said, I want a million bucks when I turn 65. If I had a million dollars, I'd feel like I had made it. Well, how would I do that? Well, if I'm 25, I only have to put away $300 a month. Actually, 381 if we want to be technical. Going back to that 35-year-old, what does that say monthly? 820? But let's jump to the 55-year-old. If we wait, which people think, oh, now I'm close to retirement, now I'll start getting ready. They need almost $5,800 a month to make it. See why it's important to save early? So I want to ask, what do you think your most important asset is? What do you think it's going to be? What's the biggest asset you'll ever own? What? <laughs> time? If you can own time, that would be pretty cool. What? Your house, your house? okay. What about a car? You guys may think a house, a car, what else? Your education, that's a good answer. Maybe your financial portfolio. What if I told you your most invaluable asset is you? Would you believe me? Somebody must have said it because I hear some giggling. <laughs> no, you were right, do you know why you're right? Because I'm all I have, okay. <laughs> No, that's okay. No, that's why we're here. You're in the right vein. No, you're in the right vein. It's you because it's your earning potential. Think about it. If you had a cash machine in your basement that was spitting out $10,000 a month or $120,000 a year, what would you do to protect it? That's you. If you earn $120,000 a year, that's you. 
Let's look at this chart one further out. And I'm going to walk over to it because I think it needs to make a point. Sorry for the microphone. Do I have a bunch of 20 year olds in there? I got some 20s? All right. If you start making $30,000 a year, by the way, it was less than your tuition this year, correct? <laughs> right? So, needless to say, you wouldn't be thrilled about that first job. But you work there, $30,000, never make a pay increase. Don't throw things at me. This is just an example, right? <laughs> if you start at 24, when you retire, you are a $1.2 million asset. All it is is 30,000, starting at 24, all the way to 65. You can do straight math. Look at it this way. You make $100,000 a year, and you started at 22 right when you graduate. Never got a pay increase, never did anything differently. You are a $4.3 million asset. So I asked the room again, what's the most important asset you have? Your ability to earn an income. It is you, 100%. And if you're lucky enough to be on this, whoa, sorry, to take myself out. And for my next trip, no, I'm just kidding. If I made $250,000 a year, I'm a $10.2 million asset. So is the house the most important thing you're ever going to own? No. On a balance sheet, it might look like it. Don't let anyone tell you you're worth less than what you are. Right, street math, ladies. I like the 100 because I can do it in my head. Mm -hmm. Right, 41 years, 4.1 million. But if you think about it, you know, you have to ask how much of that, of that, let's stick with the middle, the 100,000, how much of that 4.1 million are you going to save? How much of it are you going to spend and not know where it went? Say, I think we went to the movies and we ate out, but I'm not really sure. I bought sneakers at J. Crew, right? <laughs> We were having a side conversation, sorry, right? That's where I would challenge you. If you're the most important asset, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to earmark that asset for your future? So I want to talk a little bit about behavioral economics because this is kind of the elephant in the room. Um, because it's not what we do, sometimes why we do the things we do can help you understand why you spend money in certain ways. So the first thought is the standard school, that people are rational. By the way, would you agree or disagree that people are rational? But anyway, see as I hear the snarks, right? It means they make smart decisions about their money. They learn quickly. They choose the right products and the career path. Then you also have the other way that says people are people, which basically says um, we're, we're prone to error, right? We're going to make mistakes. And sometimes we have a pack mentality. We do it just because someone told us to. So if you think about the different ways of how you decide, you have to think about yourself. Are you the person who is emotional based? Well, guess what? When you go to invest money, when stocks are high, you're going to feel good. When stocks are low, you're going to have a pit in your stomach, right? So how do we take out a little bit of that people are people and the rational and you put it together? You educate yourself. You learn how to calm down sometimes and the little voices go, but I don't like this. But you have to understand that just because you may not want to brush your teeth before bed, you know it's the right thing to do. Now that may be harder after you've been out all night and hanging out or staying up and studying. Some of us will brush our teeth. Some of us will not. Some days we make good choices. Some days we make bad choices. But you have to try to put a habit in place so you can make better choices. So how do we save by design? Well, I would encourage you, when we talked about that 20% savings that you need to do, not every dollar goes in the same bucket. You've got to think of your money and say, what's short term? What's the stuff I need now to the next two years, like that emergency fund? Then what's midterm? Maybe what are the things that I think about when I graduate and I need to get an apartment? I'm going to need to put first and last rent down, right? I don't know if I have first and last rent, so I've got to start saving for that. What about even further, long term? Some people in this room may want to go to grad school and are thinking about now, how am I going to pay for some of those things, right? Oh, I got some serious head shaking in the front from that. I mean, no, no grad school. No paying for it, got it, OK. But what you really want to think about is we talked about that rule of thumb being 20. It's not always realistic that day one you can save 20%, but the way to challenge yourself is say, maybe today I can do eight. But next year, I'm going to make it nine. 
and every year challenge yourself to add a percentage so you can get to the 20. Does that make sense? Okay. So how many of you in the room today track your expenses now? Oh, it's actually pretty. Thank you in the back. Well, what you need to think about spending is what you really need to manage what you cover to what you need, what you owe, and candidly, what you want. And so when you think about tracking your spending, what we'll do is a follow-up to today. I actually have an entire workbook that includes budgeting and how you can do it for yourself. And there's a lot of tools that you can use both online and in paper, depending on what you like, to do that. Because what I will tell you is the sooner you start tracking your money, the faster you know where it's going. Right? We get, even if you have like Venmo, right? You get the, the, the tally, you get your Venmo report every month. So everything is doing it for you, but where is it all consolidating? Right? So we talked a little bit about 60, 20, 20, 60, 20 rule. Again, 20% should go to your savings, 60% to essential. That's everything you live off of housing, food, your loans, and your debts, because you got to pay those, right? Don't forget to pay them, okay? And then 20% have fun with. Right? You have to plan for tomorrow, but live for today. Right? You've got to understand there's both. Does this rule seem hard, easy, something you could adopt? What do you think? In your mind, 20, 60, 20. 20 for the future, 60 to live now, 20 to go have some fun. Okay? So let's talk about making savings a habit, because the decisions you make will actually help you for tomorrow. So when you think about your short-term, mid-term, and long-term like we talked about, the key thing is you really want to look at budgeting and spend what's left. Not use that 20% of fun first. Use it from the remainder, right? You also want to think of, like we said, that savings goal. Start with your own number, whatever feels comfortable, but start pulling towards it. And then again, we're going to look at increasing. But this is the slide I'm going to walk over again, and I think I was loud enough that everybody could hear me. You can imagine what my husband thinks. She's plenty loud. Right. Okay. So this slide's a little hard to see, but I actually think it may be the most important. Because how many of you right now, you don't have to raise your hand, just think about it, have student loans and a credit card? Right? It's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. I know people don't want to share that stuff. But here's the thing. Student loans sound like the bigger number, right, for most people. Student loans are 20, 30, 40. I'm not going to say numbers, right? 50 grand. Credit card maybe two, three. 4,000. In your brain, which one do you think you want to get rid of first? Student loans, right? Because it sounds bigger and scarier. But guess what? It's the credit card every single time. And the reason being is I want you guys to see on the left side we have lower interest rates and on the right side we've got high interest rates. And you always need to look at what is the interest rate you're receiving. And if you notice, the credit card is almost always to the far right. Because if you look at the fine print, I will guarantee almost every woman in this room has a credit card that is larger than 18%. Some of you, if you took it out yourself when you were a freshman, might have a 24%. And it'll say on the back, it'll say APR when you get your statements. And if you don't get paper statements, you can read it online. That's okay. But your mind thinks, my student loans are the biggest. I just want to make them go away. But most of you, your student loans are under 10%. And when you start working, you can get them down to four, five, or six. So that $3,000 you might have had on the credit card, because it has a 25% APR, cost you five grand. Just an in interest. So when you think about where to pay your money, you always want to make sure your credit card is the first thing you pay. Because it is always going to be the highest cost to borrow. Make sense? Student loans is there in the middle. The mortgage is usually on the far right. Mortgage rates, you guys can Google it, are 3, 4, 5 percent. That's a third of the credit card. The dollar amount may be bigger, but it's what's the cost to borrow it. You understand what I'm getting at? And I think sometimes we just hear our brain, I want to get rid of the big number first. It's scary. I just want it to go away. You have to do both. But always, always, always think about the high interest debt with no tax advantages. You can deduct the mortgage on your taxes. You can deduct your student loan interest on your taxes. You cannot deduct credit card interest. 
I don't know if that's new information or old information for some of you, but I want to make sure I repeat that again because it's important. Many women, when we graduate from college, what do you think the average credit card debt is across America? It's okay, it's safe, no one will judge you. Maybe they will, I won't. <laughs> Give me a number. 1,000, quadruple. The average 21-year-old female when she graduates college will have between 5,500 and 7,500 of credit card debt. Guess how much they all pay? The minimum amount. Guess what that means? Credit card companies are making money. <laughs> right? And then they start maxing their student loan payment. But the student loan payment is 4 or 5%. And the credit card is 20 to 22%. So understanding the interest rates are really important. So I would ask you, what do you see for your own future? Sometimes the best lessons we learn are from other people's mistakes. If you haven't had conversations with your parents or you think you're able to, I would ask them. Simple questions, what's the best decision you ever made about money? And then the flip side, what's the worst? Right? Ask them. If I could avoid one mistake you made financially, what would it be? Oops, I guess we're getting noisy, okay. The other thing you have to think about is you also need to grow, right? We can't just stay stagnant, sorry. We also have to move forward. So you have to understand what are you growing for. So how many of you have seen a risk reward pyramid? You ever see this in econ class? Oh, I heard a no, like disappointed. Okay, so risk reward, what you have to think about, think about a house, okay? The foundation, when someone gets a house, they talk about does it have good bones, right? Is it built well? That's what people care about. Oh, I can change a kitchen, I can paint floors, I can write all those HGTV flip shows, everything else, where it's all about the bones of the house. Well, think about the risk reward pyramid the same way. The base of the pyramid, if anyone ever did like cheerleading, which I did not, but if anyone ever did cheerleading, the base was always the sturdiness, right? And you grow from there. That's the same thing when you think about your own financial stability. You start from the bottom. The bottom is the least sexy. I'm just gonna say it, right? It's the emergency fund. It's the life insurance. It's all those things that, car insurance, if you rent an apartment, renter's insurance, right? All of those things that you kind of roll your eyes and go, oh, how much do I have to pay for this, mm -hmm. right? But it's the things that in case something happened, that's what's gonna keep you stable. Everybody with me on that one? The next step up is what we call the reserves. It's gonna be a lower risk, lower growth, lower reward, but it's your safe money. And so you'll hear when people talk about like bonds or cash equivalents, even a money market account, you're not gonna see even a CD or a bank account savings, that's maybe 1%, 2%, but it's safe. You know where it is, if you need it, you can grab it. Moving further up to the uh, pyramid is the income growth and speculation. Think of speculation and growth as like the roof of the house. Everybody wants when they graduate to set up their 401k and their IRA and everything else, right? Because it sounds sexy. That's the sexy stuff, right? I want to play in the market. Right? I want to start investing. Well, the key is you can't build a roof, the house roof first. Right? Not a very good house. I wouldn't talk about that. And so when you think about your investing, as much fun as it is to open an E-Trade account, that may not be the place to start. Yes? Okay. Make sure we're still with me. I know it's like after dinner that I'm going to snacks, right? Make sure we don't lose you. So when you think about how to build that pyramid, right? Base first, roof second. The other piece you need to think about is inflation. <coughs> I'll use tuition again. Hopefully the, the, my, my sponsors don't get mad at me. How many of you noticed that tuition changed over the few years you've been here? It's okay, we can rumble. It's okay. It's <laughs> safe zone, right? I'm a manager. I'm no one in this room's manager, so you're fine with me, right? It went up every year. And now how much grumbling do you think your parents made? Right? My father, I can tell you, I won't tell you what year I graduated, but my father, when I graduated from college, actually used to send me my tuition bill. And he would write on it, I could buy a small Mercedes for this. If you get B's, you can go to state school. Every single time tuition was due. I wish I was joking, but that is a fact. It made me very aware of money very early on. Small Mercedes in the mail every time. He didn't say a nice one or a big one, just a small one. 
That's pretty clear, right? It's pretty clear. It's in this class. You just said Elmer's Aikens, right? So what you want to think about is it's not just the pile, it's how does it grow. Right? Cable goes up every year. Milk goes up every year. I like chocolate. Chocolate's always getting more expensive. Right? Supply is going down. The need is going up. It's getting more expensive. Inflation is huge. Because what you have today may not be worth what it is in the future. Right? Typically, the federal government is saying inflation is about 2%, 2 to 3% every year. However, your income doesn't always grow 2 to 3%. Sometimes it grows more, sometimes it grows less. So you've got to always be mindful of the fact that the purchasing power has to move with it. Right? What I can buy for 100 bucks in 2018, I might only be able to buy it for 110 in 2019. I actually like this stat because I don't think any of you were born in any of these first two years. So in 1985, inflation was as high as 6.1%. And in 1990, it was 0.1. But here's the trick on that. Do you think everybody's property taxes went up in those years? Do you think the price of gasoline has gone up in those years? Well, I got a big yes in the back from that one. All right? What about sneakers, since I keep bringing those up? Those are getting pretty expensive, right? Just because consumer price index doesn't say inflation, it doesn't mean the cost of living hasn't gone up. So that can vary, but it's always getting more expensive to buy stuff. So the key thing you should look at is sometimes you should get expert guidance. What I mean by that is not just an investment or financial professional like myself, but talk to accountants, talk to attorneys, talk to people who play with money, right, all the time. Just like I suggested you talk to your parents. If you have an uncle who's an accountant or an aunt who's a, uh, an attorney, ask them the same questions. Tell me, what are some of the biggest mistakes you learned in your early years to help me avoid them? Ever notice people like to help? Ask them for some. You can call me anytime too. That's why I gave you my email to start. Most of us want to help you because if we don't, guess what happens? We gotta clean up, right? So we'd rather help you start on the right foot than have to fix what we inherit. So don't get free. I would say there's nothing wrong with having your own goal and your plans right now. So what are the steps you can take? Well, I want to encourage you to think of your life in stages. I don't know if someone's talked to you about that before, but I want to walk through. So in your early 20s, make sure it was me. <laughs> yeah, I did it. On your early 20s and 30s, you should start looking at a basic estate plan. You know, some of you in this room have known people your own age who have passed away. Do you have your own living will? You can print one on the computer. Right? Do you know what you want for yourself? Everyone in this room has a voice. Do you want to be what you want or what your parents might want? <laughs> God bless you. Are you going to ask me a question? Later? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I saw the face. Okay. Wealth accumulation. Start looking at things. When you look at an employer, ask them, what kind of benefits do you have for my retirement? Like, what are you offering me? What vehicles are already in place? And if they don't have any, that's okay. Find your own. Everybody in this room can open an IRA. Everybody's, is everybody 21 yet? Everybody in this room can open an IRA. Just back up, right? So think of yourself in your early 20s and 30s. The good news is most of you in this room can stay on your parents' health insurance until you're 26. That's awesome. I can give snaps for that. Right? That's a new rule. You're all very lucky. Be thankful. Some of your employers will have it. I would say if you can stay on your parents and they're okay with it, stay as long as you can. It'll always be less expensive on your parents' plan than on your own. If your parents are okay with it. Okay? The other thing you should look at is, do I have some things together for myself? Have an asset allocation. What that really means, start planning for retirement in a different way. Look at yourself and say, can I stomach risk? All right, if I saw money going down, do I care or don't I don't care? Start challenging yourself and say, what do I want my money to do? Your later career, 30s and 40s, that's when you're really going to start looking at your retirement strategy, not just the bucket.
pockets? What am I going to do with my pockets? Not only that, I'm going to start looking at my kids' education plan. Right? Some of you are fortunate that your parents paid for you. You may say, I want to do the same thing for my children. Some of you are fortunate because your parents made you pay your own way. You know, you're saying, well, why does that make me fortunate? Because you understand the value of your education sometimes better than your peers. Some of you are fortunate to share the load with your parents. Either way, you're here and getting a phenomenal education at one of the best schools in the country. What do you want your children to have? Right? And that starts to play. You start thinking, what do I want? And some of you are saying, I was lucky. I paid. I got my education paid. They're still going to pay That is OK. You just have to have your own philosophy. <laughs> Unfortunately, you should have a partner in crime who may have a similar philosophy, right? And that would be a significant other partner spouse to didn't catch on with my partner in crime. And then, believe it or not, the next step is looking at your early retirement. I call that the on-deck circle. Right? When retirement is so close, you can smell it, but you're not like quite there. Right? It's like waiting for the bakery before they open your home. That one. So that's when you really start looking at your estate plan. That's when people start thinking about their legacy. Right? What do I want to be known for? How do I want to be remembered? Um, if any of you are fortunate enough to have your grandparents still around, they're telling you right now what they want you to remember them for, right? And then later in the 1980s, you start thinking about, believe it or not, health care. Because do you know the biggest difference between your 65th and your 66th birthday for most people right now? It's a paycheck. So it's your job to create a paycheck for life. Now, I'm not going to get into a political debate tonight about whether or not Social Security will still exist in this room and what benefits we're going to have in the future. But what I would say is can you self-direct your own paycheck for life? And more importantly, the play check. Because by the way, what's the point of working hard all the years if you don't enjoy it? Right? So we're not retired and living off less. That's a very untrue fact. People are retiring on more. We used to think retirement was like this linear curve, but actually they say it's more like a smile of spending. Does anyone want to guess why? Yep. Yep. So the reason it's a smile, if you think about here, down, and here, the early years of retirement is when you want to go do stuff. Right? You travel, I don't know, play golf. I, I don't play golf, I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> You go hand gliding, hella skiing, whatever you want to do. You go on a cruise for four months, right? But you spend the most in the first 10 years of retirement. So we call those the go-go years, right? Because we're go, go, go. You're visiting grandkids all over the And not like go-go like boots, I heard a couple of giggles. The go-go years. Then you slow down, and we call those the slow-go years. People come to visit you, right? You don't travel as much, or you take small trips to your vacation and come back. And then, you were spot on, the top half of the slide is called the no-go years. Because where are you going? But it went up exactly as you said, because of health. I'm sorry, ladies. Sometimes I'm like the guy who tells me Santa Claus isn't real. I know, I know. But that's how retirement usually is. And we think of it in our head, I'm always going to need X. It's a smile. You're going to spend more in the beginning, a little less in the middle, and high again on the ends. And so what we need to do it's build you enough money to get you through all the things in between. Here's my other challenge on that. How long do you think the average American spent researching their last family vacation? Think of your own vacations. How much time do you spend like that? What do you think? You were right. How long do you think? For an average one week vacation, people will spend four to five weeks of planning when you add it up. <laughs> right? Think about it, spending four weeks of your time. But how often do people sit and think about their retirement, which arguably would be the longest vacation of your life? The average American spends 35 minutes every year. And do you know what those 35 minutes entail? Signing whatever form their HR director gave them, signing up for whatever form, and maybe glancing on a return. We spend more time planning a one-week vacation than a 30-year vacation. 
because that's what retirement is. Like. You retire sometime between 65 and 67, and if we're lucky, we hit about 90. But we'll tell you in this room right now, most of you will make it to 93. I know because the actuaries have figured it out. I'm still on the old table. I'm only 86. Sorry. <laughs> A year playing. So these are the basic fundamentals I really want to hammer home. The whole point is you want freedom of choice. You don't want to be told where to go, when to go, and what to spend. You want to be the master of your own destiny. It is never too late to start. You know, the whole point is we hear about everyone's dream is unique, right? Everyone's American dream is going to be a little bit different, and it should be. But you have to know when everyone says it's, it's never too late to start, mm-mm, not with money. It's never too soon to start. Remember those charts we looked at? Every year you wait costs you significant money longer down the road. There is no magic pill. There is no shortcut. This is a discipline. Some of us are better at it than others. The good news is it can be taught. So. What can we do today? Well, let's make sure we have good habits in place. You need to be mindful of your finances. If you're not starting budgeting, we're going to help you start. Finances and credit, the choices are yours. You can use every credit line you have available. In fact, I'm sure on campus there are often times like the banks are all lined up outside saying, come and sign up, we've got a new card. First question you should ask is, what's your APR? They're looking at what? How does she know to ask that? Those are the terms of what you're borrowing. Always know what your APR rates are, right? It's also in trouble if you don't manage your credit card debt and you graduate and you go to get a car, how great is that loan rate going to be? Many of you have very limited expenses right now in your credit history report. If you don't have any bills in your name, get one. If your cell phone's being paid by your parents, score for you but you need it transferred into your name because part of having credit is actually having a history. So I don't know if anybody lives off campus. Maybe many of you do. No, nobody, Any? no, nobody, not a one. I got one, okay. Make sure your cable bill at the very least is in your name, the very least. You wanna show payment history and that's why I said cell phone because whether you're living on campus or not, I'm gonna take a stab in the dark and say, everybody in the room has a cell phone, right? At least get that in your name. If you pay that every month, it's gonna show you have a good payment history. That's what they wanna see, right? Because all credit is, is an IOU. They're saying, I will give you money today if you promise to pay me every single month. Well, they're not taking your word. They wanna show what you've done. Right, it's kind of like when you're in school, and I'm gonna embarrass myself a little bit, and you would take a math test. Anyone ever get points off because I just wrote the answer? And what'd your teacher write? Show your work? I hated that. That's kind of like your credit history. They wanted you to show what you've been doing. Are you fiscally responsible? Okay? So I already hammered this home quite a bit, but I'm gonna do it again. Create a budget and start using it. You're not gonna be perfect the first time, and that is okay. The goal is to be directionally accurate, right? I'm moving in the right way. The other thing is build good habits. Start saving now, any job, even if it's babysitting, you can put some of it away if you think about it. You need to establish and preserve credit, what we were just talking about. Every time you're late on a payment, ladies, that's a negative check. Get your payments in on time. I know they say grace period, but they're watching, right? Try, this is the hardest part for a lot of us, live within your means, go back to that 20, 60, 20. If you find yourself that you're spending more than 60%, we might have to reevaluate. We talked about those buckets. Start thinking that not every dollar is the same. What's my short-term dollar for that emergency fund? What's my mid-term dollar for like when I wanna get that apartment? And what's my long-term dollar for anything fun down the future, right? So we wanna fill your buckets. So now I have a little bit of an activity and I think most of you have writing utensils or computers from what I see. So I want you to think a little bit about those buckets. So think about the next year of your life. 
I didn't say five, don't worry, next year. So believe it or not, it will be February 28th, 2019. What professional goal do you have for yourself? I would say write it down. What about a personal goal? One year, just one year goal, right? February of 19. What's happening in your life? And those of you who don't have a uh, writing utensil, I know you all have your cell phones, open an email to yourself. What do you want for you in one year? We're gonna go one step out. What do you need to do today to make that a reality? And then the last piece to think about is how much money do you need to save in order to make that happen? So what a plan for right when you graduate. Well, the first thing you wanna think about is you wanna leverage any company benefits you get. Anything they've got, you wanna use it, right? Understand the difference between good debt and bad debt like we were talking about, right? What are the things I can write off on my taxes? What are the things that are just collecting interest? Okay. This is the one I wanna take just a little bit of time about. You also need to plan for the stuff that no one is gonna tell you about when you graduate. The first piece is professional attire, and I think Katie may talk about this a little bit too. No one tells you that you need blazers and nice shoes and skirts that are a lot longer than what you wore in college. <laughs> By the way, Ann Taylor is not cheap, even on sale. Right? And there's a certain look. Oh, I, I made some giggles on that. Um, I mean, I raided my mom's closet when I first graduated, and that was like good for a month, and then I needed more. You may need different clothes depending on the type of job you take. And nobody tells you that. I'm not saying it has to be, you know, designer top of the rack, but how many of you have five different blazers and four different trouser pants and six different skirt bottoms? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. What about the actual cost of your job? Is there a commuting cost? And then this is the really sneaky one, all of those weddings. <laughs> Do you know how many bridesmaids dresses I still have in my closet and I'm 40? A lot, okay? And don't forget the bachelorette parties because I'm noticing more and more people are going away for these parties. And they're just like, hey, we're gonna go celebrate Britney, we're all going to Vegas. And you're like, I make $41,000. Awesome. And then the last part, you gotta understand and protect the most important asset, which we learned today is? You. That's right, you. So the last piece on during your job search, you really need to think about the compensation structure you want. I know we talk about often, and I'm sure you ladies hear all the time, that women are typically paid less than men. And I will tell you, it's because most of us don't challenge it in the interview. You will sit in an interview and that typically a male will say, well, thank you for coming today, and if we offer you the position, the starting salary is 55,000. And most of you are like, all right, sounds good. But why not asking, is there a range of salaries? If I have more experience, would I get compensated higher? Is there a mark or a benchmark or a way I can show you in six months if I exceed your expectations, can we renegotiate? Find out up front. I'm gonna tell you one little sad, side story, not sad, sorry, side story. Um, a girlfriend of mine, she was the youngest partner to make partner in a law firm at 29 years old in Manhattan. This is a firm which is all heterosexual white male. She is none of those things. She was so excited to make partner with her partner in life. She was ecstatic, never had a compensation talk. She just took the partner and was thrilled. Well, they had a company retreat three years later and she was sitting in a cocktail party and you know, sometimes at cocktail parties, people get a little bit looser with the conversation and there was a male partner who went to a less prestigious school, had never been published and had not won nearly as many law cases as she had and she learned when he became partner nine months after her, they gave him $47,000 more a year. I'm gonna repeat that. They gave him $47,000 more 
because she never asked in the partner meeting, how does this rate compared to my peers? You need to know how your pay increases work and when you can expect them. You need to do your research. Websites like Glassdoor are okay, they're not the best, but I would leverage your career services on campus because they have better search engines that can tell you more detailed. In fact, they can tell you what the average Wellesley graduate gets and you can base it across that. There's a lot of ways you can compare, but do your own research. So you wanna start with your first paycheck. Enroll in that retirement plan. Pay yourself first, right? Make the savings a regular part of your habits. Talk to the financial experts, like we said. Talk about options, additional coverages, additional tools. If your employer doesn't have it, it's okay, but you need to find an alternative. So you need to take control of your financial future. I want to encourage you to go to our company's website, northwesternmutual.com. There's a lot of budgets and calculators and free things you can use. Um, if you're not familiar with LearnVest.com, LearnVest is a cyber app. Some of you may follow them on like Instagram and things of that sort. Um, they work specifically on the education side. The NM.com is our website. And then the Mint.org is created by a couple of different banks to help you track all your savings. And then, like I said, you can always reach out to me. But really, I just wanted to thank you for coming today and actually being interested in being the hero of your own story and not waiting for someone else to rescue you. So thank you. Can I do Q&A? Okay. Do you want, should I? So we've got about a few minutes. Does anybody have any really pressing questions that you want to ask those have this amazing wealth of knowledge standing right here? I know, I have four consonants in the last name. I married the man, the name came with it. I saw a hand in the back and a hand in the front. I'm gonna start with the front just because I know she was excited at the beginning, if that's okay. Hi, thank Hi. you for coming. Of course, thank you for having me. Question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it out loud for the group. She said when we were looking at the financial pyramid or what I call the house, she said that you know the bottom lever is definitely not sexy and a lot of those are insurances. So how can I start kind of saving at a low risk? I would say start with a savings account. That's usually the first best bet to start with. Um, low risk, low reward. Right? Savings account is the best bet. I would say start with an automatic. Most of your banks, whether it's Wells Fargo, Chase, Santander, you can split any payment and drop, let's say, 50 bucks every week into the savings account, that's usually the first place to start. After that, you know, you start looking at what's my gut let me do. Um, you probably start looking at, depending on where you are, maybe opening a small investment account, a brokerage account, and looking at a mutual fund probably, because you can spread the risk out. In the back of the stripes, you have your hand up, but I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Jalen. Thank you. Hi. I'm wondering if credit cards have a reference for it. Um, Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, so the question is for the credit cards itself, do they have a preference for what bills you're paying? So with the credit card, they'll let you pay whatever you want. Um, in fact, if you can pay off your credit card every month, you can put your, your, your um, car payments on it. You can put your car insurance on it. But don't put more things on your credit card than you can pay off. Does that make sense? Because again, that's the highest interest rate, and you don't want to be paying extra interest for something you could have paid otherwise. So credit cards will let you charge whatever you want, doesn't mean we should, right? Um, personally, we put my car insurance and things like that on it because I get points, right? Credit cards are points, but I pay my balance every month. So it's more about what can you handle versus what the credit card will let you. Did I answer the question? Blue, and then I'll come up front. I'm sorry, I don't know any names. There's no name tags. I'm sorry, I'm shouting the color of your shirt. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, other than paying off bills, is there anything I can do to raise my credit score? Unfortunately, at this stage for you, it's all about 
what can they see? So it's, it's gonna come back to bill pay. So even like student loans, paying that shows up in the credit score. So it's gotta be things that you owe for on a credit score. To make you laugh, my parents paid off their mortgage in 1983. My mom has a terrible credit score because she has nothing in her name. Fortunately, they didn't need to borrow anything. We kind of laugh at my mom. Well, she's like, why is my credit so bad? And when you pull up the report, it's, she's no history. She hasn't had anything creditable since 1983. They're like, uh, do you exist? Like, how do we find you? Right? So that's, believe it or not, that's, she's like 75, right? So that's the difference. They just need to see what you can do. I'm coming here, and then I'll come back. Yes? Um, I have a question for, like, do you, do you have any, like, good resources for, like, creating a budget? Because I've heard, like, I'm going to have to graduate, and like, yeah. I've heard that you should spend, like, 30% of your income on, like, housing. Yep. Or, like, I yep. really, like, like, yep. I don't know, like, more, more info like that. So <laughs> if you signed in when you came in on the lap, lap top thing, <laughs> Sorry, notebook, I saw the tech. Um, Katie's going to send that to me, and anyone who's signed in, I'm going to actually send you a template of all of that. So I have a workbook for you, which actually has a case study that you can look at. It'll say, like, you know, Susie's 22, it's her first job, she's making $45,000, which buckets would you put her money in? So we have that for you as a follow-up, which the, page 13 is the budget. And in there for that 60%, the housing is a piece of it, your student loan's a piece of it, that's all part of it. So did you sign it? Yes, I did. Then you'll get it. Oh, uh, I think you had your hand up over here. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a question. So on credit card, yeah. they'll always say, like, oh, this is the minimum you can pay. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. that really yeah. So the question was, when you get your credit card bill, it says, and then I'm going to make up a number so nobody freak out, your total balance is $1,200. Minimum payment, 72 Okay. The minimum payment is what they need to not come after you. That is not what you should pay. That is the minimum before you get in trouble. Well, I'll ask you, are any of you minimum women? Are you C students? <laughs> would, you be, would your parents be happy if you came home with C's on your transcript? That's the minimum payment. That's getting a C. You passed, but you're not very proud of it. Right? So what it is, is it's an, it's an algorithm, right? The credit card's figured out based on what your balance is, what's the minimum to pass. What I would encourage you, if you can, double it. Because remember about that interest? The longer you hold the credit card balance, the more you're paid to use that cash. Right? So for every $100 on a 25% APR, what does that equal in interest? 25 bucks a year on hundred dollars. Don't you want to get rid of that as fast as possible? For every hundred dollars I borrow, they're coming for 25% extra. Don't go for the minimum if you can. If you can. Minimum on a student loan is not as bad because when we say student loan rates are between four and nine. Go minimum on your student in the early years as much as you can on the credit card. Did that help answer the question? Yeah. Use specific question. <laughs> okay. Um, offensive and defensive planning, that's what was right for me. 
But I would say take a little bit of time. You can always look at the Fortune 100 list for companies in finance. You can also look at Forbes' most admired list because that'll show you companies in like a big aggregate. And then locally, you can find a person who works at one of those firms that candidly you connect with. Because I think you'll size them up pretty early. Do you get me or not? Right? Is this about you or is this about me? Okay. Oh, she told me I can't ask any more. I can't answer any more questions. So I got to stop. All of you, please ask her. Thank you all. Um, my name's Katie Ryan. I'm the program manager for internships at Career Education. Um, and you know, I also, uh, um, just like some of you are, I'm sorry, so, like just like all of you are about to be, I'm also a Seven Sisters alumna. Um, I graduated in 2011 from Smith College. Um, and I think I was just talking to a colleague yesterday that um, sometimes my first year out of college feels like yesterday. I feel like I'm still trying to figure out things, plan budgets. Um, figure out when I can afford the next steps in my life, but I've also feel like I've come a really long way in these past seven years, and so I'm just excited to have a casual conversation, fun, um, to talk to you about some of the things I've learned, specifically about professional communication. So first, I know we've been sitting for a long time and we just heard some fun but intense things about <laughs> finance. So I want to do a little activity for a moment. So bear with me. In a minute, in just a second, I'm going to ask you all to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to start walking around the room and talk to yourself. I'm going to ask you questions, and you're just going to talk out loud, and it's going to be weird, and it's going to be awkward, but you're going to do it. You're going to bear with me. All right? So can everybody stand up? Awesome. All right, just start walking around. Get a sense for the room. Stretch, do a dance, look at other people's shoes, look in the mirror. You guys are great at this. Look at you walking around. All right, so I'm going to start asking questions and just talk out loud. If you don't know what to say, you're feeling weird, just start saying, I feel so weird. Why is Katie making me do this? Just fill it up. Just keep talking. That is the goal here. So first, what did you eat for breakfast today? There you go. If you didn't eat any breakfast, talk about why you didn't eat breakfast. What did your breakfast taste like? Where did you eat breakfast? Who did you eat it with? Yeah. All right, now could you tell me about your favorite place on campus? Describe it to somebody who's never been there. If you can't think of anything to say, just say, I can't think of anything to say. Fill the space. Just keep talking. Is it inside or outside? What do you do there? What can you see? What does it smell like? All right. Why did you come here tonight? What did you hope to learn? If you're not sure, say, I don't know what I was going to learn. I was just supposed to come to this. Yeah. And now, when you think about life after Wellesley, what are you worried about? It could be big or small. The biggest thing I was worried about when I left college was I was moving to New York, and I didn't know where to park the moving truck. I was so fixated on this. It can be anything. You're worried about finding a job. The idea is just to get these worries out. It's OK. Just keep talking. If you're not sure, say, I'm amazing, and I don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> All right, and now more fun. What are you excited about? It could be about people who you hope to meet. Maybe you get to see more family. Maybe you get to see less. It could be about things you get to do, traveling. If you're not sure what to say, just keep saying, I don't know what I'm excited about, but it's going to happen. I'm not sure. Why am I still doing this? Just keep talking it out. What makes you smile when you think about it? All right. Thank you for bearing with me. You can find your seats. You did great. 
I've done this about two or three times, and every time I hate it. But at the end, I'm really happy that I did it. So I know I said that I was going to have you do this just so you could get up for a minute and stretch. You just were sitting for a long time. But I actually had a bigger reason. Um, so as you just experienced, communicating is hard enough when you're talking to yourself, when nobody's listening, and when there's no repercussions for mistakes or being awkward. So of course it's hard to do communication when uh, you're writing an email to an alumna, or you are talking to your boss about a deadline that was missed, or you're trying to pitch an idea to your team. Communication is difficult. It requires tact and care and social awareness, and in many ways it's an art. But communication skills are absolutely something that we can learn. Um, I, I'm guessing, based on my experience in that, this activity, that as you got going with it, it became a little bit more natural to talk to yourself and walk around. It just kind of started flowing. You're just in your own ideas in your mind. Um, and I want to argue that so too um, professional communication is something that you can get the swing of thing, get into the swing of things as you practice and have more experience with it. And so tonight, I'm going to kind of help us through that with some practice examples through some scenarios. But, but first, um, why I'm, I'm talking about uh, communication. So not only is it something that all of us can practice regardless of where we are in our professional careers, but it's also something that in survey after survey across industries, employers rate communication as the number one skill that they're looking for out of their new hires. And that's written and oral communication. In other words, no matter what you do, no matter where you work, no matter what role you're in, communication is going to be vitally important to what you do. And I want to also emphasize that I'm not talking just about formal presentations like I'm doing today or written reports. It's those little moments throughout your life. It's talking it to your coworkers at lunch. It's sending quick little emails. It's those everyday interactions. So, um, you know, of course, there's countless strategies to learn about communication. There's been countless books that have been written. There are courses you can take. Of course, you can always come to career education. But the best piece of advice I can give you in this moment is just to simply recognize it takes practice, like I said. And those of us who enjoy speaking in public or enjoy writing, even we need to practice. I practiced this three times this week. Um, and so practice is going to take many forms. It's going to take observation, trying, failing asking for feedback and trying again. Um, and one thing I always try to remember myself is just to slow down, to empathize with those that I'm speaking to or writing for. In other words, I try to keep my audience in mind. And I really try to listen. And it's these kinds of strategies that can prevent us from rushing into judgment, making sloppy mistakes, or saying or writing something that we're later going to regret. And of course, I could go on about this all day. Um, and I encourage you to come and speak to your career education mentor or advisors. If you want to discuss these things more in depth, we can um, help you with specific skills such as active listening and asking good questions and written etiquette. Um, but in the meantime, tonight, I want to practice our communication skills by going through a few scenarios. All right. So our first scenario is Sangeeta. Sangeeta is a recent graduate who's interested in historic preservation, but she's having a hard time finding a job. And she recently um, came across an alumna on LinkedIn um, who works for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She's really excited about this. And she'd like to speak to her about career advice in the field. So here is the first draft of her email. Hi. I graduated from Wellesley in 2017 with a degree in history. I saw on LinkedIn that you work for the National Trust for Historic Preservation Sorry, she used the acronym. And I wondered if you know about any available jobs. I'd like to find work in historic preservation, but I haven't been able to find anything. Would you be willing to meet over coffee to talk about opportunities? Thanks. What do people think about this email? Uh, yeah. Uh. Anything specific that you see maybe could be a red flag? Yeah. You shouldn't ask for jobs. Yeah. Anything else? That's what I was going to say. It's very direct. <laughs> yeah. But also kind of vague. So let's go through it. Whoa, lots of red. All right, so first, hi. It's pretty casual. Um, you want to stick more to the formalities in an introductory email like this. She also uses this acronym without spelling it out. She might 
she doesn't know. Maybe the, the organization doesn't use that acronym. Maybe it's just something that wouldn't be used and so that it's just more um, professional to spell it out. Like many of you said, the introductory email is not the place to ask for that first job. Um, also, she uh, very vaguely says, are you willing to meet? But she doesn't give a specific time. Having a specific time frame is so helpful when people um, are trying to schedule something with you. And also, she doesn't really tell us anything about herself. We know she's a wealthy alumna. We know that she studied in history. But what specifically is she interested in? What are, what are her specific skills? So let's see her second draft. Dear Ms. Lyshenko, my name is Sangeeta Narayan, and I recently graduated from Wellesley in 2017 with a degree in history. For the last few months, I've been researching careers in historic preservation. I came across your LinkedIn profile and would like to know more about your experience working for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I'd appreciate learning about your career path. I was wondering if we could set up a brief meeting sometime this month so I can learn more about the field, what you do, and how you got to be in your position. Please let me know if this is something you have time for and your availability in the coming weeks. I look forward to hearing from you soon and connecting over our shared interest in preservation and experiences in Wellesley. Thank you so much for your time. Sincerely, Sangeeta. And she gives her contact information. Introductory emails like these are so important because they serve as your first impression. You want to put your best foot forward. So as a result, you're going to want to lean more towards the formal side. You want to be clear and concise about what you want to learn and why you want to talk to that person specifically. That way they'll be able to figure out whether they're actually the right person for you to talk to. And like we said, it's not the right time to ask for a job. It's not the right time to ask for a recommendation. Um, you're going to want to establish a relationship with this person first. And maybe through subsequent conversations, that can be something that comes up. But first, you want to share information about yourself, what you're interested in, what your skills are. Um, and the secret is, alumna want to talk to you guys. They are so excited to share their insights and their stories and their experiences. And you want to initiate conversations, letting them know that you want to learn about those stories. And so I want you to um, think about these types of emails as relationship building rather than transactions. All right. Scenario two, canceling an appointment. So here's our context. Alex is attending a digital marketing conference. She strikes up friendly conversation with somebody at a top firm. And this acquaintance invite Alex to come back to um, the offices later to learn about a new software that Alex had been considering um, adopting for her company. But um, unfortunately, Alex has an unexpected um, emergency and has to leave the com conference early. Um, and so she's going to be unable to visit that firm as planned. So here's the email she sends to cancel. Yep, she didn't send one. <laughs> she didn't send one. So this wasn't a technical glitch, as you know. Um, I didn't forget to write anything, but Alex did. Um, and I know that emergencies come up and we are so busy, but it is so important to send those cancellation emails, no matter how brief. Um, you know, in almost all situations, we have our phone with us. We have a computer or a tablet or something. And just that one moment of sending an email makes that other person know we value their time. And such messages are an essential way to ensure that professional relationships aren't damaged or, or even destroyed. So here's something really brief that Alex could have written. Dear Ms. Buxton, I am so sorry for the short notice, but I will be unable to visit your firm tomorrow as planned. Due to a family emergency, I had to leave the conference early to return home. I was truly looking forward to learning more about how your firm new uses this new software and continuing our conversations about the trends in the field. It was such a pleasure meeting you yesterday. I hope we can connect again at next year's conference. My sincerest apologies. So again, I just want to say that this email enabled the, her professional relationship with Ms. Buxton to continue on in the future. Super brief. It gave a very quick reason why she can't come. She didn't have to go into specifics. Um, she implied that she wants to continue working with her, that she was excited about it. Something came up. And so the next year when she runs into her at the next conference, Ms. Buxton is going to be excited about that and check in with her. Want to know what happened. All right, scenario three. 
So here we have Lucia, and she recently started a job at a hydraulic engineering company. And um, she knows that she's totally qualified, but she feels the need to prove herself often because she's one of the only women in the firm. And last week, her boss asked her to design a type of experimental model um, that she's not familiar with. She doesn't even know where to start. So what should she do? Should she immediately tell her boss that she doesn't know how to create such a model? Should she do some research and create a model just based on what she finds on her own? Should she pretend that she was never actually assigned this and never do it and hope no one notices? Or should she do a bit of research to learn more about the bottle and then ask a boss or another colleague for further guidance? Votes for A? B? My favorite option, C? No? We all think D? Yeah, you're right, Wellesley students. So yes, um, your supervisor is there to help you solve problems, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily um, your first go-to. Um, even if you don't have the first clue where to start, there's always some sort of research that you can do. This could mean um, developing an action plan, doing a quick Google search, collecting data that might be relevant. And so that way, when you do reach out for guidance, um, you can show through your pre-work that you're willing to take initiative and, t and put in the effort. And your conversation will be more productive because you've actually done some research and you have that grounded knowledge. All right, so let's see an email that she could write once she's done that research, asking for extra help. Hi, Amir. Admittedly, I'm having a bit of difficulty working on the experimental model you asked me to do last week. I'm not very familiar with the technique, so I spent the last few days doing a bit of research. So far, I've learned X and done Y, but I still don't feel that I know enough to produce a model that meets our company standards. I wanted to ask if I could find a time on your calendar early next week to discuss this model in more detail. I believe that learning from your expertise and insight would be the best way for me to move forward. All right, so I'll say right now that I wrote this email a bit more casually than I did the other ones, um, and that's because I'm assuming that Lucia knows Amir. They have a first name relationship, um, but depending on where you end up working, it might be more formal or, or even less formal. Um, she specifically asks what she's interested in. Maybe Amir gave her a whole bunch of different tasks. So she specifically says the one she wants help on. She tells him about the different research that she's done. Um, and she also acknowledges um, that she understands her limitations. She has that self-awareness to know when to ask for help. Um, and so this um, can not only help show that she has um, tried, she's put the initiative, but she also recognizes that she's in a team and that she can learn so much from them. All right, our final scenario. So Jenny works as a production assistant for a TV show. Depending on a bunch of factors, different paperwork need to be filed for each show. So last night a show aired and staff realized that paperwork wasn't submitted. Jenny's boss sends her an angry email telling her that she needs to be more careful. Feeling upset and confused about how this happened, Jenny reviews her notes and realizes this mistake wasn't her fault. Someone else on the team failed to communicate something to her. In her frustration, she writes this email draft. Hi, Vanessa. I just received your message about the missing paperwork for last night's episode. While I understand I'm responsible for submitting this form, I can only do so after Susanna sends me the required information. Unfortunately, Susanna never sent me the information ahead of time. As a result, I encourage you to reach out to Susanna to find out what happened with the situation so it doesn't happen again. Jenny. All right, so talk to the person next to you. What do you think of this email? Take a minute. All right, finish your thoughts. All right, can anybody share what you talked about with your teammate? What do we think? I heard a lot of thoughts. First impressions. Yeah. It's a pretty passive-aggressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts? Passive-aggressive. That's the gist, right? All right, so here we see that she's obviously deflecting responsibility, even as she admits that she had a role to play in this process. She's putting all the blame on Susanna without sending this email to Susanna, so Susanna's being thrown under the bus, right? 
Um, her email leaves it up to her boss and Susanna to fix the problem. And her tone comes across as demissive and condescending. It's passive aggressive. This isn't probably the best idea when writing to your boss, right? So luckily for Jenny, this was her first draft. She didn't send it because she slowed down. She had some empathy. So the next hour, she wrote a new, new email and she wrote it to both Vanessa and Susanna. She says, I'm so sorry to hear about the missing paperwork for last night's show. Please let me know if, I can, if there's anything I can do this morning to sort things out. Susanna, looking through my notes, I realized that you and I must have had a miscommunication about this. Let's figure out a better system so that doesn't happen again going forward. Of course, this season, we're already through most of it already. Next year, would a periodic check-in meeting be helpful? Or maybe we should have a meeting before the broadcast season to review the deadlines together so that we're on the same page. I want to ensure that nothing falls between the cracks. Sorry again for the mix-up, Jenny. So she, her tone's clearly totally different. She's not falling on the sword here, but she's taking responsibility. She understands that this was a team effort, and she provides specific examples of how to fix this situation, not just now, but also going forward. This shows that she's proactive um, and a team player, and this email might not necessarily um, fix the problem in and of itself. There's probably going to be more work, but whereas the other email could have made things worse, this email might be able um, to be the first steps to making things better. All right. So now that we've worked through these communication strategies together, I want to use our remaining time to review the many other resources that career education can offer. This is just a taste of the types of problems and scenarios that we can work through with you. Um, and you know, like this, this slide says, career education um, is such a wonderful office in the sense that you don't have just have us now, you have us for your whole lifetimes. Um, so tonight I'm going to focus on the resources geared towards alumna, but I'm sure many of you know most, if not all, of these things are also open to you now. Um, so here we go. So I think the crown jewel in our model is our, all of our advising staff. So career education offers alumna different advising options depending on their needs. So we have alumna advisors for general career guidance and advice that are specifically trained to work with alumna at all different stages of their career. We also have career community advisors for um, more industry specific insights and information. And then finally, for those of you who are interested in grad school, applying to fellowships, doing um, independent research projects, for instance, our fellowships director, Kate Dalinger, will work with you again throughout your lifetimes. There are even alumnas in their 80s who are getting fellowships through Wellesley. Um, so she is an amazing resource. And um, our advisors provide uh, alumna with a wide variety of, of tools and resources, um, including resume and cover letter um, review, LinkedIn review, um, the look over personal statements and other types of documents like that. They'll help you with interview prep. Um, and may, many of you might know that our office offers the suit program to students. So if you have an interview, you can come and, and rent out a suit from us. It's free. You just have to return it dry cleaned. And that's open to alumna too if you're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for real. Um, we have them in all sorts of sizes. We also have suits um, available for trans students. Um, and so if you're around in the area, please take advantage of, of this program. Um, and this is open to current students. We'll offer advice on um, negotiation and networking, negotiation being a big thing that Felice just mentioned. Um, we'll also offer guidance on topics such as graduate school, job trends, career changes, professional advancement. Um, and you'll also get access, as you do now, to the Wellesley Hive. Have, have any of you logged into the Wellesley Hive? Most of you? Yeah. So I, I think it's so cool. As a smithy, I am so insanely gen jealous of the Hive. I love that you can search people based on their interests, based on where they live, based on their industries. Um, and so you know right away that not only are those people um, ones that have expertise in what you're interested in, but they've specifically said, I want to talk about this thing. Also, I don't know if you've checked it out, but when you um, use the feature where you can message an alumna to request a mentorship meeting, it pre-populates it for you. So you don't have to try to recreate um, you know, an email such as the one we did in scenario one. It'll put that in for you. And if you try, you can change it to whatever you want, but if you do something that maybe isn't 
best practice, it'll flag it in red and say, hey, maybe try to be more formal here, or hey, that's actually a typo. It's awesome. We also recognize the wonderful diversity uh, of Wellesley students and alumna, and so as a result, we're constantly trying to develop resources to support students and alumna of all backgrounds, identities, and cultures, um, and this includes uh, resources, support, professional networks for alumna of color, LGBT alumna, and alumna with disabilities. And we also um, can point you towards legal resources to navigate topics such as visa processes um, for international students, um, equal empo employment right information, and discrimination in the workplace. And on that, I want to kind of transition just for a moment to a more serious topic. Um, I, I recognize that probably a lot of you um, have this on your minds a little bit, um, that when you transition from Wellesley to the workplace, um, sexual misconduct is something that um, you might encounter or you might have a friend that encounters it. Um, and I completely recognize that I don't have the time tonight to go into this to the level of detail that it deserves. Um, but I do want to um, at least show you and offer you some resources um, that you have in hand. Um, I also want to say that when we say sexual misconduct in the workplace, that doesn't necessarily just mean the physical office space. It can also refer to other areas of professional relationships, such as con conferences, mentor meetings, um, and other types of professional development programs. And also, although recent news stories have focused um, on the issue in more high-profile industries, such as um, entertainment or politics, we're all aware that this can happen anywhere in any field. Um, and so with that, spent, that said, I'm just going to spend the next couple of minutes just reviewing these different resources um, and also know that on the front table there was a handout for um, some, some information as well. So first and foremost is the Wellesley's College Title IX page. Um, Jacqueline Anchando, our Title IX coordinator, has been working with our office specifically to make sure that we offer you appropriate resources and that we as staff are properly trained to have conversations about you with this. Um, and so if you or someone you know uh, ever encounter sexual misconduct, whether it happens on or off campus, such as an internship, um, you can come to us um, for, for help and guidance. Um, and you can find out more about um, our policies through this website. And this is something that we can also share with all of you, so you can just have the links right away. RAIN is uh, the largest anti-sexual violence organization in the country, and so after you graduate, this will probably be the starting point to find resources, um, con it, it, considering if you stay in the United States. Um, so if you go onto this website, you'll see that um, RAIN offers a hotline, it offers online chat options if someone you know or if you need to talk about um, an, an encounter with sexual assaults or harassment. Um, and I want to note that RAIN offers several PSA videos that they encourage people to watch to get a sense of what sexual harassment is. Um, and these are, are, are good videos, but we do want to point out that we recognize that in real life it could happen in more contexts than they maybe show. There might be bystanders there. Um, the genders of the people involved might be different. Um, and so hopefully you don't encounter a situation like this, but if you do, RAIN is, again, um, one of the good first places to go for more information. There's also Sasha. Sasha is a good starting point to find resources if you move abroad, you're working abroad. Um, the Sasha Outreach and Education Department offers free, country-specific, um, know-before-you-go information. Um, so they can provide in-depth information about social and cultural norms, gender equality, sexual violence, LGBTQ concerns, medical care, reporting a crime, you name it, um, in international locations. And like RAIN, they also offer a hotline. Um, the Know Your Rights Guide um, from, is from Equal Rights Advocates. And as I said earlier, this, this topic could be its own presentation. We can't go through all of this. Um, but the Know Your Rights Guide is what is up at the front. Um, so hopefully you can grab that on your way out. Um, so yep, this will be sent to you. You'll have all of it. So I'm. I know that's a heavy topic. To wrap up on a slightly lighter note, I recognize that um, so many of us, um, I rec sorry, um, it's, it's often the little things, I guess, for me that I always worried about when I was graduating. It wasn't so much finding the job. Like I said, it was like where I was going to park the moving van. I didn't even have a job or an apartment, but I just didn't know how I was going to park a van in New York City. Um, and so we get it. Like we understand that 
sometimes it's just those adulting things that are the most scary. Um, and so we've tried to start putting together resources that can kind of get to some of those smaller little things. Um, we have some basic tips on how to find affordable and safe housing and things to consider, like questions to ask roommates or remembering that your rent isn't all it is. There's often utilities involved, cable bill, that kind of thing. We have basic budgeting tools, nowhere near as extensive as Felice's tool, but it could help you get through a summer. <laughs> um, we also have advice on curating that professional wardrobe on a budget. Um, some key pieces to have sites that offer good sales and are more affordable than maybe Ann Taylor. Um, and as you know, uh, we'll also help you with best practices on professional communication. Um, and that includes networking and informational interviews. So thank you all so much for sticking around. I hope this was fun. And if you have any questions, you got me. <laughs>